Good morning. Good morning. Turn with me over to Psalm 103. We're just there. I had a whole introduction planned, and um, I'm going to pivot a little bit. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are found. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works. Everywhere in his dominion, praise the Lord, my soul. This morning we're talking about the church. We're continuing with our study talking about what does the Bible say about the church. I had a whole word association. When I say church, what do you think of all this stuff? But the church was lived out this morning for me personally. As, as Josh read that passage and shared his heart about how it affected him, I needed that. And I could sit at home and read that passage and probably tear up and get inspired. But it's something different when we come together, when we're all reading the same thing, when we're diving into God's Word, when we're inspired by how this passage impacted someone else. That's the church. I think it was a display, at least for me this morning, of why we need each other. We need these reminders. We need one another. And that's the whole point of, of the church, the whole point of God's kingdom, which is our title this morning, Kingdom Life. We've been talking about what it means to study the Bible with someone. How do we help someone know what it means to follow Christ, to be a Christian? What we shared a few weeks ago was there was three main things for someone to know. Fall in love with God. What does it mean to fall in love with God? What does it mean to fall in love with the church? And to understand the gospel and respond. Three things someone needs to know or experience. To fall in love with God, to fall in love with the church, and to understand the gospel and respond. Last week, Anthony did a phenomenal job walking through what the gospel message is. And calling us to respond to it, but also to call others in our lives to respond to it as well. That's, that's critical. Today we're going to be talking about the church. What does it mean to fall in love with the church? What is God's plan and God's design for the church? And that's quite an undertaking because if I had done the word association thing that I started with, there's a lot of things associated with church. Some good, some bad, and everywhere in between. But we're going to look at God's word today and what God says about the church. The Holy Spirit infused church of God. That's what we're going to look at today. Let's, before we dive into all that, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for giving us the kingdom, giving us one another relationships. God, in our inmost being, we desire to praise you. I pray that our, our uh, attention this morning, our, our heart, our, the conviction that comes through the Holy Spirit, that all that can be an act of praising you. Thank you for bringing us together, for ordaining this time, and allow us to get more from your word than we had coming in, to come out with deeper convictions, with a strong stance on what it means to be connected to you through the family of God. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So it's one thing to become a Christian, but God knows that it's a challenge to live as a Christian. Yeah. And so God gives us things 
and sets us up for success. It's not just becoming a Christian, it's staying a Christian. I often joke that we should celebrate funerals a lot more than we celebrate baptisms. Because it means someone made it. It doesn't mean we don't celebrate baptism. That's exciting. But that's the beginning. But when someone makes it, when they die faithful, that's the goal. And God gives us so many things to help us stay faithful. Because He knows it's challenging. We have, of course, through Him, through the death of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. God in us, living and helping direct us and convict us and expose what's true and what's wrong and, and justice and righteousness and, and our sins get exposed through the Holy Spirit. And praise Him for that. We also have the Word of God, Scriptures, to make sure that we know the will of God and we're applying it in our life. We also have the church. You know, it's kind of like a, a registry, right? Before you get married, you fell. These are all the things we're going to need. Maybe, maybe Sam and Linnea have done this or started to do this or it's on their list of things to do. They're like, James, stop talking about it. You're stressing us out. But we go through before you get married and you register. Okay, I need a toaster. I need this. I need that. And it's kind of like, okay, if I'm going to live this Christian life, these are some things I need. And there are things maybe we need a little bit less. Elena and I registered for Nerf guns when we got married. Um, and I, I still think we needed those. And we got some awesome Nerf guns from our registry. Just an idea for Sam and Linnea. But uh, God gives us these things so that we can live our life for Him and devoted to Him. But what is the church? If, if the church is a gift from God to live and devote ourselves to Him, what actually is the church? The Greek word is ecclesia, it's the people, it's those called out of darkness to live for God, the ecclesia, it's, it's the people. But oftentimes church is associated, let me stick this back on here for a second, as a place, right? I'm going to church, we go to church, I was at church, it's a place. You know the little phrase, here's the church, here's the steeple, open it up, here's all the people, does this sound familiar? Some of you are like, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> the church, the steeple. But, but it's incorrect, right? This is not the church. This is just a little stick on top. This is the church. So it's really, here's the church, here's the church, and here's the church. The people make up the church. It is the people that when we meet together, when we engage with one another, we're living out God's intention for the church to be together and to worship together. In some ways we have to get away. It helps us a little bit that over the past couple years we were roaming at, at one point, so we knew the church wasn't a building or the parking lot or wherever we were, right? We knew the church was the people that God had brought together. What's cool about the Bible is there are so many metaphors explaining what the church is like. We're going to look at a couple of them today. Uh, the first one is that the church is compared to, in the Bible, to the body. Church is compared to a body. You can write these down. We're actually going to look at a few scriptures later. We're going to run through these a little bit quickly. But Colossians 1.18 describes Christ as head of the body. And the body is described as the church. Which means God, and this also happens in 1 Corinthians 12, God describes the church as a body. As different parts and ligaments working together to actually fulfill the will of Christ who is the head. The church is also compared to a home. Ephesians 2, verse 19 speaks of this. And he is uh, the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that everything he might be preeminent. I think that's actually the Colossians passage that's on the screen there. But uh, we can turn to Ephesians together. Ephesians chapter 2. I made a big thing about not turning to these. And now we're going to turn to them. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. That's good. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. So here the church is described as a house, as something that's built up. And who, who's in the house? The people. The family of God come together, and the church is built up like a house, a home. Next, we have the temple, still in Ephesians 2, verse 20. Uh, we just read 20, let's read verse 21. In him, the whole building is joined together and arises to become a holy temple in the Lord. So the church is described as a temple, as something glorious, a temple for anyone reading this. There was, of course, the, the, uh, the Jewish temple, which was massive and huge and ornate, and people would come from all over the world to worship God at the temple. 
But there was also the temple of Artemis and the temple of, of Zeus and all the, the temple of the gods were known as being glorious in nature. And here it says that the church, these, these um, uh, ragtag group of Christians gathering and huddling in each other's homes, that that was now the temple. That that was now this glorious place where people could get to know God on an intimate level and worship together. The, the church is compared to a temple. Another metaphor used in the Bible is the church is compared to a bride. This happens in Revelation, of course, but in Ephesians chapter 5, in this passage about marriage where it says, you know, husbands, love your wives in the way that Christ loves the church. And he talks about this mystery of, it's that basically you can understand God's love towards the church when you really get a healthy love of, of a husband and wife loving one. And he's like, it, it doesn't make sense, but it comes together. And later in Ephesians, he uses that, that word a, a few times. So this is a mystery. Who can really understand it? But the whole point is that the church is described or compared to the, being the bride of Christ. As a side note, right? If you've got an issue with my bride, you've got an issue with me. Yeah. Right? So if someone says, hey, I like, I like Christ. I want to follow Christ. I'm going to do that on my own. I have an issue with church. You've got an issue with church. You've got an issue with Jesus. Because it's his church. It's not perfect, but it's his church. And he redeems it and he sanctifies it. And so no one can rightly say and be in line with scripture that I got a problem. I, I love Jesus, but I got an issue with the church. We got to resolve that because the church is the body and the pride and the house of God. Amen. Don't get me wrong. We got issues with church. We got it. We're people. We're, we, we got problems. We're going to talk about that later. But we've got to really make sure that we're, we're clinging to what the Bible says about um, about his church. And a bride on the wedding day, beautiful, radiant picture of what it means to be full of life. I think I have a picture here of when I first saw Elena walking down the aisle. I was filled with emotion. Not my most flattering picture. Elena likes to make fun of it every once in a while. You know, just, I wasn't posing. It was just, I was filled with awe. You thought I was going to show her for a second, but I'm showing me. Uh, this, just seeing her in her radiant glory filled me with awe, and she's more radiant every single day. She's not even here. I'm not even saying that for her. I'm saying that just so you know how awesome she is, right? Uh, she's feeling a little sick, so she headed home. So you can pray for her. But she's radiant even in her sickness. Amen. But she's my bride, and I love her, and that's how God feels about his church. And, and, and we're aware, any, anyone who's married is aware of the issues and the flaws with a spouse, but, but God, though he is aware, loves the church the way that a husband is called to love is his wife. And so there's this powerful metaphor. And so for us, when we're teaching someone what it means to be part of the church, it's important because uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I guess I'm walking around without this, but 1 Corinthians 12 <laughs> says that we're baptized into the body of Christ. And so when we become a Christian, it's not on our own. We're not this you know, little finger that gets attached to the head of Christ. You know, the head, Christ is the head. We're not sticking out of the head. We're attached to the body the body of Christ. And we need one another to live that out. We're baptized into the body of Christ. And so explaining and setting out the church with a friend is literally helping someone know what they're getting into. Because yeah. they're baptized into the body, into Christ. And when you think about all these metaphors we just talked about, right? We got uh, the body, we have a house, we have the temple, and we have a bride. All these metaphors have one thing in common. They're all alive. What I mean by that is, you know, a, a body, of course, is alive. The church is an organism, right? It's not an organization, but it, it's a living, breathing aspect when we see the church this way. A physical home obviously isn't alive, but a, an empty house without a living family inside is a, an abandoned property. It has no value but except for what is inside of it that gives it life. A temple that's not actively being used for communal worship, we call that a ruin. You can change the picture. Okay, there we go. But we would call that ruins, right? A temple that's not being used for communal worship is ruined. People go and take pictures and, and think about what was, but it's not changing. It's not alive. It's dead. And then, of course, a bride. Some might say that on, on a wedding day, it's kind of this, this picture of life and excitement and connection. A, a bride is full of life on her wedding day. So all these describe the church as being alive. 
When was the last time you thought about church as being alive? Maybe earlier today, maybe weeks ago, maybe it's been a long time. I think sometimes we can focus on the things that aren't alive. We can focus on what's not alive in our hearts since we're a part of the church. And we can miss the whole point of church is to experience life the way that God intended. You know, this, uh, this study that we're doing here isn't about the technical or doctrinal details of the church. That's important, by the way. It's important that the church we are connected to and a part of has accurate biblical teaching on what it means to be a Christian, on what it means to have our sins forgiven, on what the gospel message is, on what it means to follow Christ, on what sin is. It is crucial that, that a church has strong biblical convictions on these things. Otherwise, though it might be a happy, fun, filled place, it's not alive if it's not in line with Scripture. But we're not talking about all the, the technical or doctrinal details. We're talking about what it means to be alive in church, what it means to, to live out the, the, uh, the aspect of church. Today's lesson is called Kingdom Life because the kingdom or the church is a lifestyle. And we're living this life. Just like we're helping someone and studying out the church, we're helping them know what they're getting into. We're also helping people get a life. Don't say that. That could be offensive, right? But it's really get a life. And to get a life, to understand what it means to be part of God's living church. So there's a few things that we're going to talk about today as we break down the lifestyle of the church. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10. Three quick points, three cultural necessities for a healthy church. Three cultural necessities for a healthy church. But before we get into that, I do got to give a disclaimer. Church is not perfect. Oh, I'm just kidding. That didn't blow anyone's mind, right? We're aware of this. Church is not perfect. It's filled with imperfect people. Hello, greet your neighbor. Hi, I'm imperfect. So am I. You know that? We're filled with imperfect people. In fact, in my life, I've been hurt more by other Christians and people in church more than I have people outside of church. Now I'm a minister, so most of the people I spend time with are in a church setting. So, but I think it's true, right? We, the people we love tend to hurt us the most, right? The people that we spend time around and invest in. The church is filled with people. Sometimes we, we take it harder because we feel like, okay, you're a Christian. You should know better. And that's not false, but it makes it harder sometimes to resolve when we experience hurt or imperfections in church. But what's cool is when we are in love with the church, when we're living like the church is alive and really recognizing the Spirit of God actively sanctifying His people in the church, when we live that and embody that through how we spend our time and how we engage with one another, when we open up the Scriptures to study this with someone, it's not technical. Our life shows that. Our life is an overflow of the things that we love. And we show that. The more that we love the church the way that God does, knowing it's imperfect, but that God says... This is my church. This is, you know, on this rock, I'm going to build this church. God is actively working. If we can recognize that through how we live, that will overflow in our conversations and Bible studies with others. So three, that's kind of a side note there, but three cultural components, cultural necessities for a healthy church. The first is the power of being there. The power of being there. There's just something important about showing up. When the body is meeting together. You know those raffles or, or contests that you can enter? And it says, you don't have to be here to accept the prize. You know those ones, right, where you fill out the yeah. raffle and you're like, okay, they're yeah. going to call me. I put my phone number on the back. I don't know if that's true or not because I've never won one of those. <laughs> so I don't know. But that's not how church works. You do have to be there to get the prize. You do got to show up. It's showing up that makes a difference. Your presence makes a difference. Of course, in your own life, but your presence makes a difference for someone else as well. Yeah. Spirit-filled things happen when we simply show up. Sometimes you come in and show up with a bad attitude, having a bad day, but sometimes the heart of just, you just got to show up. You guys have seen the movie, it's an older movie, Moneyball. You know, the, the whole premise is they're trying to get people that can just get on base. Like, you don't have to hit a homer, you just got to get on first base. Right, if we can find people that can get on first base, if you just show up, you're going to experience the glory of spirit-filled community. Just choosing to show up. When we don't show or make the fellowship a priority, we actually hamper them the Spirit's work. And we're limiting what God has designed. And we see this spelled out in Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, I'll actually turn there here in a second. This is kind of a quintessential passage here on what it means to be part of community. Um, 
All right, Hebrews 10. We'll start in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly, which side note is my favorite word in the whole Bible, unswervingly. It just sounds great. Uh, to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a reminder here to not give up meeting together. The word here, some translations might say to not neglect meeting together. The Greek word is to not forsake, to not abandon, to not let go of the habit of meeting together. Which is easy to do. It became really easy during COVID times over the past few years to kind of give up, to get out of the habit of being family, to get out of the habit of being a community. You know, we've as Christians and in our fellowship, we've probably seen this verse so many times, but we gotta ask the question: Am I in the habit of being present or am I in the habit of being absent? Maybe that's a question of heart. We've got to show up, but am I am I am I present? Am I really there? Am I in the habit of being present or in the habit of being absent? One of my favorite examples or, or illustrations for this is really seeing church like family dinner. Or seeing whenever the, your small group or your Bible talk or whatever meets up, that's, that's a family meal. And something is prepared. And, and I'd love to say, and I've shared this with a few people over the past couple weeks, but yes, as, as a, a, a minister, I'm preparing a sermon. But it's really God is preparing this time together, right? It's not so much what I'm saying, it's about, even as we talked about what Josh shared, hit, hit me and a conversation after service might impact you. God is setting the table and there's a place for everyone. But like family dinner, sometimes, you know, Tommy's got swim practice. And swim practice runs late. And Tommy's like, hey, I'm not going to make it tonight. Okay, well, well, we'll save you a plate for later, right? We'll put that away. But what happens in church is we don't really realize that for every person in the church, the, a placemat is there. So when you're not there, you're kind of sitting there, okay, is Tommy coming? Should we start now? Should we pray? Should we wait? This food's getting cold. What, but I don't think we see ourselves in the community that way. We're like, hey, they're, they're lucky if I show up. I'm pretty awesome if I'm there, you know. And we're kind of like, okay, I, I get that. But if you saw that as family dinner, as there's a place for me, and stuff happens, right? I'm not going to be there, but just communicate. If that's our view of church, that's family. That's what it's like to be a family together. It's saying, hey, I, I want to be there. Something might happen. Stuff happens all the time, right? But this, this heart of, I understand there's a place in that for me. And I, I'm either going to be there or I'm going to get the leftovers later, right? But just knowing that and knowing that that's how community works. And that's different in our individualistic, westernized minds. We don't like that. We're like, well, don't put a, I didn't ask you to put a placemat out for me, but you know, I'm, own, I'm going to McDonald's. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, we, and we miss the community aspect that's all throughout the Bible, all throughout God's Word, calling us to that mentality. Right? And so we got to make meeting together a habit. So cultural component number one is that a member of the church, and this is, by the way, specific to our church here in Pittsburgh, of the culture we want to build here. A member of the church is active in attendance and being part of a small group. This is the culture that we want to build, that every disciple in our fellowship here is active in being present with the church and also actively engaged in a small group or ministry. That's pretty standard, but that's important for us to, to really build together and to all say, okay, that's the culture we want to build here. And that's the culture we want to see in others, but we've also got to live out that culture ourselves as well. I do want to lift a few people up that are really going after this. Giovanni's working this weekend. He works as an EMT every other weekend. But uh, Giovanni, who got baptized about a year ago, he loves church fellowship and, and um, he has to fight for it because of his challenging work schedule at times. And uh, sometimes he will show up after working over the weekend. He'll, he'll, have, he'll have worked all Saturday night into Sunday morning, sleep an hour, and then he'll show up on Sunday ready to engage and bring his mom and his brother out, and it's really cool. But a few weeks ago, he was like, what are we doing this weekend? I, just, I need some fellowship. I'm, I'm missing it. I need some fellowship. And it's like that heart. I feel like sometimes we get away from that, right? We're like, okay, oh, wow. We don't have anything this weekend. Sweet. I can do it. We kind of, can, surely we've never thought that way. I'm sure. But to really love and, and treasure fellowship, Giovanni does a great way, of, uh, does a great job of doing that. You know, the parents in the uh, teen ministry, in the preteen ministry, have really gone after making the PTPs a priority. And man, when everyone shows up, it makes a difference. 
just uh, a few weeks ago, you could really tell, man, there's a lot of teens there to, to build a, a rich conversation for their teen lesson. There's a lot of parents here to lean on one another and help each other. I love that the parents are striving to make that a priority. You know, they're not here today because Bruce actually tested for COVID, be praying for him, but the Coons, Bruce and Nancy, they live out in Morgantown, West Virginia. And I think they're the first people here on Sundays, right? They're here about a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes early. And they're, they're, they're filled with fellowship and engaging in conversations because they're, they're far away. They're, they want to go the, I was going to say extra mile, but it's like extra miles, right? To engage in the community and, and to be there. What a great example that is. So it's important to show up, to practice presence. As much as possible, let people know when you can't be there because that's what a family does. But let's strive to be a family. That's the power of being there. Another cultural component, life and limb. Finding your part, finding your part within the community. Let's read this together over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay. Amen. I know for some of this, this is a reminder. For some of this, this is teaching us how to help others. But hopefully for all of this, this is a call higher to, be, to build this culture together. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we are all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an ear, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Basically, as we look at this passage or are familiar with this passage, God has organized all the parts together with different gifts and different strengths. And that together, the purpose of the body, the purpose of the community is, is fulfilled. And so we've got to, if we're going to be part of the church, to know our role. What are my strengths? How do I serve? How do I help build up the church? Because the church is alive, everyone who joins the church changes it. And our engagement with the church affects the, the operations of the body. It takes all of us. I, I used to, um, with the campus ministry, teaching this concept, I would do an exercise where I'd say, okay, you have to get from this side of the room to that side of the room. The floor is lava. Here's a couple of things you can stand on. And one person is, you know, see no evil. They have a blindfold on. One person is hear no evil, some noise-canceling headphones, and speak no evil. One person can't speak. And so they have to communicate and find a way to help each other get across. And the whole point was some of us are great at seeing. Some of us are great at speaking. Some of us are great at listening. And we need each other to be able to fulfill this, right? So imagine that going on right here. That's cool. But you see the, 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 the needs of one another uh, to be able to, to accomplish something or the strengths, uh, utilizing the strengths of one another is important. We just put on a few, uh, I guess a few months ago now, a 5K to raise money for uh, Ukraine refugees over in Moldova. And we needed so many different people. I think Linnea was over there with the stopwatch at the end. The Tyrese were there with the, the, they were doing registration, but mostly Rich was helping with the music and, and getting some music going over there. If you know Rich, he brings the little portable speaker just about everywhere he goes. It's pretty awesome, right? That's his gift. That's his, his role. That and mints are his role. <laughs> just kidding. He serves in many other ways. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I can't help it. Um, but we needed uh, the people organizing the race, the people running the race. All those things came together to accomplish something. That's what the body's like. There's so many different parts and different roles that people serve. Don't you want to be part of the body? And, and, and don't you want to be a part of the body that makes it awesome? That's what we're meant to do, it, it, being a part of the body, being part of the community. So cultural component number two is pretty simple. We want every member of the church to serve in at least two different ways in building up the church. The two different ways is specific to here in Pittsburgh, but there's plenty of needs. There's needs in children's ministry, needs in song ministry, needs in, in ushering, needs in, in leadership, needs in serving on the board or planning some service events. There's plenty of service needs. And sometimes we can be like, okay, I, I do my one thing. And praise God that that's your mentality to serve in that way. But most of us, if we're going to build this church, if we're going to build this culture, 
needs to be about two or three. For a little. Okay, I help with children's ministry these two months. I help with this these two months. I do this, I do that. When we all agree to that, when we all live this out, when this is our culture, we can joyfully build up the church together and, and, and coming together and living out this passage. I want to lift up, you know, Jennifer, she's in children's right now, but Jennifer was baptized in December, and now she's helping to run all of children's ministry. Yeah. And what a heart that is to serve and to serve my kids, her kids, and, and our kids together. And I know they need more, more uh, workers for children's ministry as well. Mary Beth works tirelessly. Like, she takes vacation time to help with the budgeting for the church. Yeah. She takes time off of work, uses vacation days, to work then for the church as well, and to build up the church and to serve. She does all the administration work for the church, and we're really grateful for Mary Beth. Even recently, uh, Quaison and the Kirby's went over and helped the, the Mitchells move, and I think the Kirby's went as well to help Gabby Spence move yesterday from Slippery Road. Just serving one another, and it doesn't have to be an official capacity. Sometimes it's just, hey, here's a need, and I want an answer. But part of being the church is agreeing to the reality that, you know what, we need to serve. And we need to help each other. And by doing that, we get connected and help one another. And there's times where we feel like, man, I have a lot to give. And times we feel like we don't have a lot to give. But just choosing to show up and to give what we have is what God is calling us to do. Let's look at the last component here, life together. Turn with me over to Luke 24. Life together. If we're going to be God's church, we don't just go with God, but we need to grow with God. We've got to be a church that grows together. Luke 24, uh, I read this recently and uh, never looked at this passage in, the, in terms of how it affects or maybe the example it gives for our one another relationships. But read with me starting in verse 13. It says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things and each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the road? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened uh, there in these days? What things? He asked. We'll, we'll actually stop there. So Jesus, hours after rising from the dead, being in a tomb, takes it upon himself to walk with these two guys. These two guys who don't fully get the gospel message. And he's quite literally walking with them to help them understand God more. What I love about this is you have an example of, of what we're meant to be like in Christ. That we walk with one another. Now he's literally walking with them, but what is he doing? He's helping them know the gospel message. And eventually he's going to have this big reveal and be like, it was me the whole time! And it's this Really funny story here that you go read on your own in, in Luke 24. But the whole point is that Jesus, who would have every excuse to be like, I was just dead. <laughs> he takes the time to go and walk with these guys. They're not part of the 12. Who knows if they're part of the full 72 disciples there at the end. They're just two guys that want to know more about Jesus. And he's willing to walk with them. Hours after his, he was dead to help them know more. We as Christians, if we're part of the church, we've got to be in the habit of walking together. The habit of walking with each other and helping us really know what it's like and helping one another know what it's like to follow Jesus. You know, we do that, by the way, in house churches. We do that when we meet in our small groups. We do that, of course, in big church. We do that when we're a part of each other's lives. The city ministry met uh, this past week on Friday night for Sabbath night. And we were just singing around a campfire and we were talking about God and we are talking about the book of James and how it applies in this translation and that translation, and we were just talking, what, what's great about your week? What was rough about your week? We were just living life together. That's how it's meant to be, right? And sometimes we need it in our schedule to be able to do that, but it's about living life together and engaging, meeting up purposely, sometimes moving people, being active in our communication. That's how we engage and we grow with God together. And by the way, you get out of it, these one another relationships, you get out of it what you put into it. Right? We want meaningful relationships. We've got to invest to, to experience those. And so the cultural component that we've talked about uh, a lot over the past few months is, is still this. We want every disciple to be in the habit of meeting with another disciple once a week to talk about life and about God. 
That's, we've, we've talked about that a lot in our midweeks, but that's kind of the goal, is that every disciple, every member is in the habit of meeting with someone else in this room to talk about life and God once a week. And so you put those together, component number one is, hey, we're in the habit of meeting up together in the group setting and meeting and being engaged in a small group. We're also in the habit of serving in, in two, three areas in the church to help build up the church. And lastly, if we're all committed to engaging in one-on-one -on -one relationships once a week to talk about life in God, if we're living that out, man, the culture of the church will be alive. We'll experience the, the alive church that we're meant to experience in God. The choice is ours. You can get lots of marriage help, lots of parenting help. You can build great friendships or not so much. Depends on what you're willing to put into building up the church. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can be like a limb that's fallen asleep. You would never have, you know, their leg fall asleep. I used to sleep on my, my face kind of like this. And uh, if you do that, I don't know about you, but I lose circulation to my arm and I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, you know, oh. And a few times I, I've whacked Elena and she wakes up, like, what's going on? But, but that happens when we, we lose circulation. So sometimes we can be connected to the community, but we've lost some circulation. And we're, we're this limb that's kind of wildly swinging around, but we're not getting the connection that we're meant to have. And we're missing it, so we gotta engage in the kind of relationship where we're talking about real things with one another. And we're engaged in building up the church. You know, spiritual growth is the goal. That's God's vision, to grow and, and to, to be built up in Him. And that takes all of us. Growth should be our norm as a church, not perfection. But if we're known as a church that strives to grow, praise God, praise God He's not expecting us to tick off every box, but He is expecting us to strive to grow, to be a church that, that our culture is growth, to grow and to, to uh, help one another, and to, uh, to engage in, in what we just described here, walking with one another. So to live out God's plan for the church, it takes building up a culture. It's going to take all of us. You know, what happens when every person does their part? When every person says, I want to help build up the church? Well, we experience kingdom life. We're living out the kingdom of God together. So two questions, uh, you can skip over to the homework slide. There you go. Two questions that we talked about with this series. Kind of homework for you is uh, a question to ask one another, and then a question to maybe ask someone outside of our church, right? Someone that's not here. Uh, one another question is this, when viewing the church, how can you personally set your mind on things above? You know, this is from Colossians chapter 1. It talks about setting our mind on things above. Seeing church not just as something physical, but something spiritual. So how can you set your mind on things above? And a question for those in the grocery store, for the mechanic, for a neighbor, for a friend. What makes a church seem alive? What makes a church seem alive? I believe if we take the time this week to ask those questions to people that we interact with, uh, God will bless that as we're striving to help each other in the process. The church is alive, brothers and sisters. When we come to church and we study out kingdom life with our friends, we're inviting them to God's plan to change the whole world. That's what the church is, God's plan to change the whole world. For so many people, Jesus was simply a good teacher who died, like Buddha or Muhammad. But that's not what we believe. Right? We believe that Jesus is still alive. But how do you prove that? How do you prove that Jesus is still alive? I believe that the church is the living body of Christ. And the church proves that Jesus is alive. We're the proof that Jesus is still alive. And by being an alive church, we point people to this reality. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive. The church is alive. Let's live as members and, and live this lifestyle of a kingdom life together.